Hello, I'm Paul Bradshaw. And I'm Lauren Gray. Welcome to Viral History, your weekly look at all things history. Coming up on this week's show, I sit down with historian, writer and columnist Fern Riddell. And we take another visit to the world of Tudor medicine in the surgeon's room. But first, let's go to the news. A medieval ring fort containing the remains of 800 bodies has been revealed in Ireland. The settlement, which had a jewellery workshop and extensive farming, was probably occupied between the 6th and the 11th centuries. And a medieval sword engraved with words and animals has been discovered on a golf course in Suffolk. The weapon was likely lost during the Battle of Fornham in 1173. Next up, Fern Riddell is a cultural historian and an expert in sex, suffrage and entertainment in the Victorian and Edwardian eras. And since 2014 she's been cultural historian for the primetime BBC and Amazon drama Ripper Street. Recently Viral History had great pleasure in talking with her. What is it about Victorian society and its mores in particular that continue to fascinate? I think we are absolutely captivated by the Victorian period. We have never left it behind and it holds us so much in our cultural history. Especially at the moment, we really are seeing a resurgence in Victorian rhetoric, Victorian ideas, conservative values and a restrained or repressed society. But the actual Victorian period is very different and it takes historians like me and other historians working in the Victorian era to be able to hold up a mirror to the past and say, you might think it's one way, but actually it's very different. And sometimes they might actually be better than us. Victorian society had this reputation for duality, um, a strict outward moral code of conduct that hid a much darker set of behaviours and moralities. I think you do have examples of it. We definitely have moments of deviant sexual behaviour, often um, upper class men who are taking advantage of a system that doesn't protect women and girls, or boys really, or anyone. Um, and we have a number of exposures during, or exposés during the Victorian period, like W.T. Stead, revealing that he's been able to buy a 13-year-old girl for sex in the capital and how horrific this is. And this revelation in the papers is really what causes us to raise the age of consent to 16. So it's a very important moment. But those stories have dominated what we think about history and have come to be our only understanding of the Victorian period and sex in the Victorian period. And actually the reality is very different. The majority of people have very modern ideas about sex. They think that sexual pleasure is really important. They focus on female sexual pleasure as being the thing that everyone needs to understand and know about because they think it's the only way you got pregnant was if the woman had an orgasm. And we never talk about this when we're talking about the Victorians. We never talk about how much they valued love and sex and they thought those two things were absolutely key and you couldn't separate them. We have really only one understanding of sex in the Victorian period and that is this deviant, dark morality. And much like today, it happened but it's a very small part. The majority of Victorians had very healthy, active interests in sex. And we can see that from all of the incredible sex guides and birth control pamphlets and campaigning to get sexual knowledge into every room and every home that the Victorians are engaging in, especially in the 1870s, where it's really led by a female campaigner, it's led by Annie Besant, who publishes a sex guide that has had a circulation of about 700 books since the 1840s. And in 1877, when she publishes it and she takes out advertisements in the paper saying that it's happening and that it tells you every birth control method you could have, the publication and the circulation explodes to 125,000 in the space of about three months. So there's clearly a huge desire for sexual knowledge in the Victorian period and we've never acknowledged that in our understanding of them. Now you've worked as historical advisor on the series Ripper Street. How was that experience and what do you think about the final product? 
I will never forget the first time I met Richard Warlow, who's our creator and showrunner for River Street. And it's all the fault of Toby Finlay, who's uh, one of our incredible writers, who introduced me and invited me really to come on board with them when they came back from series three because Ripper Street had been cancelled by the BBC at the end of uh, series two, because there wasn't thought to be the interest there. Of course, the fans, which I was one of, absolutely despaired and campaigned really hard to see it come back. Amazon took it up and we were given another three series. And I will never get over my joy of having been part of something so exceptional. Ripper Street, both as a historian and as a fan, is an incredible drama because of Richard's commitment and the whole team at Tiger Aspect's commitment to authenticity. I have never worked with a team that have cared so much about getting it right. And that's in every single thing, that's in every scene, but it starts far more earlier than that. It starts in the beginning, in the production meetings. Um, I get to see scripts, I get to sit there and listen to the character arcs and, and tell them stories from history, things that I've studied that no one else knows about. You will not find anywhere else on screen an entire hour of drama devoted to telling the story of a female doctor in the East End trying to get birth control out to her patients. You won't see this in documentaries, but you see it in Ripper Street because Richard and Will and everyone at Tiger Aspect thought that's a really interesting story because we have got a consultant who knows about it and we'll use it. We'll find a way to, to make that work for us. And it, it gives you goosebumps, it gives you chills to see these storylines that you've worked on so intimately and care about so passionately be used or brought back to life in a, in a way when they've been so forgotten. And I, I absolutely cannot express the joy that I've had in, in being part of this show. And they're an incredible team, absolutely incredible team. Uh, it's great to finally get Fern Riddell on the show. <laughs> Next up on Viral History, it's time to head back to the 16th century and make another visit to the surgeon's room. Hello and welcome back to the surgeon's room where we're with the surgeon, Kevin Goodman. And last week I asked you to guess what bodily fluid we might be talking about this week. Well, it is urine. So Kevin, over to you. Talk to us about urine. People used to think that we were made up of the four humours. Uh, blood, phlegm, yellow bile and black bile. If your humours are equal, in balance, you're healthy. If you have too much of one humour or not enough, then you're unhealthy. Well, one of the ways of finding out which was which humour uh, was out of balance was by using urine. So, what's the first thing we're going to do? Well, hopefully I'm not going to have to test anything. No. <laughs> <laughs> A sample of urine would be brought to either the physician or the surgeon. The first thing he's going to do is going to look at the colour. Colour was so important in the diagnosing. Over here, if you look at this chart, this is a copy from the uh, Facilities de Medicinae by Johannes de Ketham. It's a copy. It was the first book printed on medicine and surgery in 1492. We've got different colours of urine. Now, not only do, does that tell us which is the dominant humour, but it can also be an indication of how food is being digested. So it's a really important diagnostic tool. So, for example, here, You've got the urine going from red to brown. Obviously, you've got a lot of blood there. It can be a symptom of cancer, so it's very important. As we go down, we go from green to black. Now, what that mean, it means is you've got too much black bile, which means you're going to die. A lot of black bile is never good. Now, the next test that we're going to do, 
is smell. Why smell? Well, you can actually tell what a person's been eating or drinking by the smell. Think asparagus. And the next test is people think the surgeons on physicians drank urine, they didn't. The finger went in and it would be tasted. Now, up until the 1940s, the test for diabetes type 2 was tasting the urine. If the urine was sweet, it meant the person had diabetes type 2 because the Latin name for diabetes type 2 is diabetes mellitus, which means sweet urine. And something else that is really important is in the case of physicians, a lot of lords, because they had to pay a lot of money for physicians, it would set them little tests. And one European lord actually set a test for a physician. He swapped his urine with that of a pregnant serving girl. Along comes the uh, physician, looks at colour, smell, taste, and says, Sire, you're in excellent health. And in a couple of months' time, you'll perform a miracle when you give birth to a healthy baby. <laughs> Today, what is the test for pregnancy? You wee on a stick. It detects the hormones. It could taste the concentration of hormones. Mm -hmm. So even today, testing of urine is still important. Very similar. That's fantastic. So those processes have been developed through yeah. time, but fundamentally are yeah. still very similar. Yeah. Only the difference today is they use little tabs. We, and we don't taste. Exactly. Which is a good thing. <laughs> well, thank you very much again, Kevin. A lovely chat, as always. And next week, tune in. We'll be talking about more things to do with surgery with Kevin Goodman. Fascinating stuff, but I prefer modern doctors. And modern hospitals with painkillers. <laughs> next up, here's Marguerite with On This Day. Thirteenth of April. Conjoined twins... Chang and Eng Bunker married sisters Sarah and Adelaide Yeats today in 1843 and proceeded to sire 21 children. Well, that's about it from us for this week. Feel free to hit the subscribe button, follow Viral History on Facebook, Twitter and Instagram, like this video and tune in next week. And remember, what's past is prologue. See you in seven days. Next up, Fern Riddell is a cultural historian and an expert in sex, suffrage and entertainment in the Victorian and... <laughs> I feel like I've said those lines already. <laughs> it comes from the Fanta.